Welcome to the What If It's Not Depression podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Achina Stein, and today we're going to be talking about concussion. Uh, Dr. Spencer Zimmerman is joining me today, and he is uniquely trained as both a nurse practitioner and chiropractor who blends functional medicine and functional neurology. He works with patients battling concussion, depression, anxiety, PTSD, dizziness, vertigo, and other neurological-based conditions. If you like this podcast, please click the like button and subscribe. Hello, Dr. Z. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, well, we have a lot to discuss. We were discussing things uh, before we started, and it's like, wait, I gotta, know. I have to record this. <laughs> so, so I'm glad we stopped talking and started recording. Uh, I'm so happy that you're zooming in from Idaho of all places, um, and uh, you know I've been there once, and uh, it was had a great time last year, and it was a really, really beautiful, beautiful place. So hailing in from Idaho. So, you know, well, let's just start where, you know, I love to have people start about how they get into the whole brain injury world or the the thing that they are passionate about. I would love for you to talk about that and, and you know, do, do a deep dive on this subject. Yeah. So one of the big things in chiropractic is like, okay, the nervous system is a master system of the body. And there was a lot of lip service done to it, but not a lot of real deep understanding. And I found a group that was doing it and I just kind of lashed on because right before I found them, I was ready to drop out of school. Mm. And I hopped in, did the diplomate in neurology program. And as I was doing that, they opened up a brain injury clinic in Dallas where I was at. And I'd come home every single day because I mean, this is the thing that kept me in school and is defined where I'm at, raving about all these amazing results these patients were getting. And after a few months, my wife was like, it's not, is it not normal to have those symptoms? I was like, no, like it's not normal to have brain fog, headaches, dizziness, you know, all of those. And she's like, oh, because I have them. And I knew she had headaches before, but they were a lot better since she stopped like Mountain Dew, you know, has changed nutrition, brain fog had also improved a lot, but there was a lot of things that were just so common to her. It was part of her normal. Right. I know and, so many people live with these kinds of symptoms and other symptoms as if that's what's normal. And it was, you know, it was, it really hurt because here I am, you know, I mean, like we worked with NFL, Navy SEALs, like, you know, very, very high level people. And yet the person right here who I cared more about than anyone else, when I did her brief little evaluation to the best I could at that point in time, she did worse than the average patient I had. And I was like, oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> and it was like, wait, have you suffered a concussion? Well, no, not that I've ever been told. And I knew she had some car accidents. And so I dug in more than that. It's like, well, I had a whiplash and some jaw issues when I was 13, went to the doctor. Oh, you know, just whiplash. You'll be okay. She was still struggling. And her parents like, oh, you know, you've already been to the doctor. They said, there's nothing you can do. And then I've got a real soft spot for teenagers with concussions because it gets blamed on puberty and you're changing schools and you're changing friends. So there's all of these explaining away of what could have been a concussion, you know, and she had a couple more car accidents. It's like, wow. So I'm helping those who know they're struggling with concussions, but the majority of those who are struggling with concussions, they have no clue. Either one, they've been diagnosed and they kind of timed it out of it being something that could impact them or two, a lot of people, they just never get the diagnosis to begin with. And so they chase everything else underneath the sun to try right. to figure out what's driving their symptoms of depression, fatigue, word finding, sleep issues, and so much more. Right, right. I Yeah, I to and I think the most common diagnosis that's given to people is ADD or ADHD, right? Yeah. Yeah, ADHD. <laughs> Yep. ADHD. I mean, there was a study out of Israel. They looked at pediatrics. They were more likely. So 25% were diagnosed with ADHD, depression, anxiety, and insomnia. Those mm -hmm. were the diagnoses they were given when it should have been concussion. Right. Right. Wow. Yeah. So how do you distinguish, um, 
how someone has had these symptoms that you just explained uh, as a brain injury or a concussion. So we've got to look back at how to diagnose a concussion because a lot of people, they'll go in and they just say, here's what happened. Oh, you had a concussion or you didn't. But let's step back and, you know, they've just released the criteria for diagnosing it, mm -hmm. a fully updated one. One is, did you have an appropriate mechanism of injury? Now, a lot of people say, well, did you hit your head? It's like, yes, but you don't have to hit your head to have a concussion. A whiplash mechanism can do it, right? So you take a hit to the shoulder, like lots of people will fall off their bikes or fall off their horses. They'll land on their back, they'll land on their shoulder, they'll get a shoulder injury. And because they break their collarbone or something, everything goes to the broken bone. Mm -hmm. And people ignore the fact they had a whiplash mechanism. So, mm -hmm. so do you have the mechanism? Two, did you lose consciousness? Now, don't think too highly of that one, okay? Only 10% of concussions lose consciousness. Mm -hmm. So do you have the other symptoms though, right? As we talked about brain fog, depression, anxiety, dizziness, blurry vision, you don't have to have nausea and vomiting, but those are the ones people think of like, oh yeah, you had a concussion, right? You got nailed in the head. You were lost consciousness. You were vomiting all over the place. Of course you had a concussion, right. but it's like most concussions will never have that. So do you have that? And then even then you still shouldn't quite yet be diagnosing a concussion, even if they have the right symptoms. You've got to say, do you have the right testing for it? And currently the only agreed upon testing is eye movement testing and balance testing. So, mm -hmm. and then some cognition are those off. If those are off now, you finally met criteria mm -hmm. because as your listeners have heard, you know, so many people talk about depression. And when you say all of those symptoms with a concussion, you're like, wow, a lot of people with depression, they have it. And you're like, I you're right. And so we've got to make sure it's a concussion and maybe it's not someone's thyroid or their gut. Cause we want to, attribute it to the right cause and not just lump it in because that's kind of our bias. Right. Right. Are there any other mechanisms be besides this uh, whiplash kind of mechanism? Um, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, you know, sort of falling, falling on your bottom and uh, all, almost like shocking the vagus nerve. Uh, that comes up, you know, is, is that considered a, 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 a mechanism or would that be something completely different? No, that can, that's actually listed as a mechanism is falling on your bottom. You get this kind of oscillation up through your entire spine mm -hmm. and that can do it. You know, if we look at the most common causes of concussion, it's slip and falls. Mm -hmm. Number one, car accidents. Number two, everyone thinks of sports, but sports, once again, it's not in the top two, you know, it's, it's kind of down there. Um, Domestic abuse is very common with concussions, but not diagnosed. And then I also want you to think about, yes, we're talking about concussions, but non-contact because mm -hmm. um, you can basically get these chemical concussions from like COVID and other infections. So you get post-infectious brain injuries mm. that very much treats the brain like a concussion as well. Mm -hmm. And what about, what about repetitive, um, uh, injuries uh, with regards to sports, like, uh, like hitting your head with a soccer ball, or just even just practicing with the soccer ball, rep repeatedly hitting again and again and again with their, with their head. Would you include that as, uh, as a possible cause as well? Well, that can't necessarily cause a concussion. It wouldn't be listed as a concussion. Can it disrupt the brain and how it's functioning and then lead to depression? Some of those symptoms over time. Absolutely. Right. We just want to make it a concussion diagnosis. Right, right. Yeah. So as you can set, see, or I hope everyone sees as they're, they're listening to this, that it falls on a spectrum, right? And the diagnosis is given based on where in the spectrum that they that it falls on, but it doesn't mean that there, it isn't a problem, <laughs> right? It can be problematic for people. It's just given a different diagnosis. Correct. Especially, you know, like, you're in Rhode Island, they've got people playing hockey, you know, and other places where they're playing football and everything else. It's the repetitive hits to the head are every bit as dangerous as being knocked out. And actually in many instances, I think they're worse because it's one thing when you get knocked out, you know, like there's going to be precautions now in most of the sports. But right. when you're just taking these routine blows to the head, 
no one's stopping anything. No one's checking your brain health and saying like, oh, wow. So since Johnny's been playing, you know, football, he just hasn't been the same and, and he's never had a concussion. But don't forget about those just repetitive blows to the head and how it does damage over time because it's, you know, and that's what people skip is it right. wasn't a singular event. Right, right. It's 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 wear and tear <laughs> uh, over time, and I think that's really important to point out that a lot of people seem to miss, and which is why I posed the question. <laughs> so I think you did a great job with uh, explaining the differences. So so what is the difference between a concussion and brain injury? I think really hard line differences. Just just to be clear. Uh, about the differences we talked about all the different types of injuries but where does where is the line drawn is it just criteria so it's more of a knowing the definition so all concussions 100 percent of concussions are traumatic brain injuries mm -hmm. every single one of them is a traumatic brain injury but not all traumatic brain injuries are concussion so like let's say you've got mri findings or ct findings you've left concussion land and that's where a lot of people get hurt is they think they've got a concussion. They go to the ER and they're like, Hey, your imaging looks great. You don't have a concussion. Move on. It's like, it was always going to be normal. Like right. that's meant for bleeds and fractures and other things to that level. So that's really the difference is all brain injury or all concussions are brain injuries, but not all brain injuries are concussions. Hmm. Okay. So, um, as we move on, you know, I, it sounds to me that, um, and I know from my experience with some patients that I see for this is that there are different, uh, ideas about what treatments are out there. And so can you talk about what the proper treatment and evaluation is for a concussion and how does, how is that also distinguished from brain injury? Yeah. So you can use really the same evaluation and treatment for both. Um, you know, as we're saying really from a brain injury perspective, that's where imaging becomes beneficial. If you're like, Hey, you know what? I think this is more severe. Cause when we look at once again, a spectrum, right. Concussions are considered more of on the mild traumatic brain injury side, but I don't want that to fool people as in like, Oh, well, it's just mild. It's, it's self-resolving. Everyone's better in a very short time. Cause that's not necessarily true. So when we look at evaluation, evaluation really is around eye movements, balance, and cognition. So I always recommend to my parents whose kids are playing sports, it's, look, doing a cognitive test isn't a great baseline. It's not a great baseline. What do you think when you imagine, right, the athletic trainer running the field, right? You're like, oh, they're, they're going to do this, right? They're going to they're gonna make them track. Rip out your phone. Have your kid follow your thumb with their eyes left and right up and down and see how they do record it. So that way you can come back. If something does happen, have them do it again and be like, Hey, wow, that looked a lot worse. I think we need to get you checked out. Or they do those movements like, okay, that gave me a headache. You know, you look, they need further evaluation. The other thing is balance is really important. Mm -hmm. Now what you want to look at in balance, and this one works really good with phones is you want to do feet fairly close to each other, eyes open, eyes closed on a firm surface, but then do eyes open, eyes closed on a balance pad. So like for us, right, you can get one of these off Amazon, 30 bucks, or just even use an old pillow or couch cushion, eyes open, eyes closed on there, record it before, because, and then that way something happens, you know where they're at. And that's one of the hardest things with concussions is People have no clue where someone was at before it ever happened because they don't have good baselines. But if you have that baseline, now you can set yourself up, your kids, whoever it is, for success. And you're like, okay, that's off. Now I need to bring you for further evaluation because you've got the symptoms and that. You know, let a professional really work through that. And then with treatment, you know, there's definitely some of those myths, right? Let's go to the oldest myth of all time. Like, Okay, the best thing you can do when you have a concussion is go sit in a dark room. We're going to do sensory deprivation, just, you know, no sensation, right? Turn off the lights. Don't do that. Please, please do not do that. None mm -hmm. of the research backs that. It actually right. shows to slow recovery. 
Mm. The best thing you can do up front is exercise. Now we don't want to exercise fooling his symptoms, but some physical exercise will actually speed up recovery. Started at 24 to 48 hours. I like stationary bikes. Mm. I, I really like those, especially if you got other musculoskeletal injuries that can work really, really well. Um, do that. Don't push through it. Don't even go crazy, but like three minutes, every two hours with stationary bike drives blood flow to the brain, drives oxygen, helps with growth factors, right. quieting down inflammation. Super important sleep. Please, please, please make sure they are getting good sleep. Cause a lot of people with concussions can develop insomnia. Mm. And when you develop insomnia, now there's more inflammation in the brain. It slows down recovery. But if you can get them sleeping, and I don't care if they're sleeping 12 hours, like, wow, they're sleeping a lot more. Right. Don't care. Good. Yeah. Well, the Good. brain needs it. The brain needs it to, to be able to recover. Yep. And, and it makes it easier. Honestly, the hardest patients I have are those that only sleep three to four hours. It is brutal helping them recover. And then nutrition you know, good fats, good protein, right? Please no processed foods, like, no sugar. you know, <laughs> no sugars. Don't put them on this roller coaster because you have this mismatch of energy and blood flow, especially in the acute phase of a concussion. And you don't want to make it worse. And if you've got ketone powders, actually sip on some ketones, like right. don't, don't just down the whole thing, but kind of recharge throughout the day with it. It's like, Hey, I'm just going to sip it every hour. Ketones help as a great fuel source, but they're also anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. So those are, you know, between nutrition, sleep, um, some physical exercise, you know, that's really where you want to focus. Yes. You know, it can be good to be out of school and other things like that, but. Right. Right. Yes. I, I agree with you that the research um, shows that movement is really important, uh, It, but it's modulating that movement and doing it safely. That's also uh, equally it has important and that the nutrition and the sleep and uh, is, is also really important to continue. Um, you know, you did mention earlier that the gut is, uh, it may not be caused by the gut, but these concussions can disrupt the gut as well. So it might be a one, two punch, so to speak, <laughs> to the body that it, that's then affecting the brain. So you, you mentioned uh, looking at eye movements um, and balance, but the third criteria, which is cognition, is, uh, are, is another place where people can have symptoms that you might test. How would you do that? What do you look for? Yeah. So, I mean, in the office, you know, we're doing computerized testing. We're doing different paper tests, you know, like Stroop tests and things like that. Say, okay, what's happening with cognition? But even at home, like if your kid's doing schoolwork and you're like, what's happened in their grades? Because you'll see A students or B students become C and F students. And you're like, wait, what's going on? Mm -hmm. Like, don't just blame it on there's a transition. They've changed friends. Like, right. you know, consider this could be at play where it's like, wow, what's happening? Do you feel as sharp as you were? Are you struggling with word finding? Word finding is a very big issue with concussions. Mm -hmm. And so don't downplay that. So it's not even that you always have to have the testing for it. Just trust your symptoms and don't try to make excuses for it, right? That's, yeah. you get it, get an evaluation. And then you say, does that meet it? Mm -hmm. And if it does, fantastic. If it doesn't, look, that's not the cause. Right. It's looking at all the areas and then looking for history that might explain it. So look, doing a deeper dive and being more suspicious, having that index of suspicion about, hey, maybe this is related to a concussion. Let's really figure that out and talk about it again, because you're absolutely right that sometimes people just dismiss it. Oh, no, I never had a concussion. But then, well, do, do you do this? Do you do this? Do you do this? Like, oh, well, what about this? Have you ever fallen sideways? Have you ever fallen a off of a bike, um, you know, do you ride horses, <laughs> things like that. It's really important to do a deeper dive to get that history. But, you know, I'm curious from your population, because obviously you see a lot of people, how, how, what is the timeline on average that you see these symptoms appear? Once you do uh, con a connecting of the dots, so to speak, 
how early or how how connected to that event once you I, if you do isolate an event or events especially if it's repetitive do you notice that these symptoms then show up is it weeks is it months is it years <laughs> Yeah, so for most of the concussions, you're going to get at least some sort of initial onset of symptoms within hours to 48 hours. If, if it occurs after that, you can't say, well, it was a true concussion because you've got to have that quicker onset. But you don't necessarily have to have all the symptoms. So you may have had a concussion that gave you some of the initial symptoms. And then four months later, now you've got depression. Mm -hmm. Or even 10 years later, you've got depression. And it stems from that concussion because we do know a large amount of people who have concussions will ultimately end up with depression mm. and it impacts females much more than males mm. and so it's really stepping back and saying hey i've got depression Ooh. or i've got fatigue and and that's why like for me i don't even fully try to market always to concussions because going back to my wife she had no clue she was suffering and a lot of the patients i get who come in they're like, I've got depression. And as I'm going through their history, I'm like, you sure? And then I'll do their brain testing. And it's like, that's what you've got. Or you get others who are like, hey, doc, like, I've got fatigue. I've got brain fog. Um, and it's some other stuff. It's got to be my thyroid. Like, run my thyroid again. Run my thyroid again. And it's like, <laughs> thyroid's normal. Again. But it's like, but your yeah. brain doesn't look as healthy as it should be. Right. Right, so, which can be due to thyroid, but if you if if you're doing the testing and and the thyroid is, you know, normal and and you really are you know clearly normal and not just you know maybe normal, but um and you know obviously we we run quite a bit of testing to figure out what it is, but it's connecting all the dots and and looking to see perhaps it is one piece of the puzzle that needs to be addressed. So let's say like, well, like with your wife, and I mean, obviously we have patients that have anxiety and depression and PTSD. How would you treat those people differently now that you have figured out, oh, you know, I think you also have symptoms of brain injury too. How would you treat them differently with that new insight? So the brain's very much like a muscle. If if you want to strengthen your bicep, you're going to do that differently than you do your quad. But you're also going to evaluate the strength of your bicep differently than your quad. Mm -hmm. And with the balance eye movements, we get, can really map out the brain. And so then we do specific therapies to rehab the brain, eyes, balance, hand-eye coordination. But once again, because it's like a muscle... You don't just work it out. You've got to say, is it set up for success, right? Like you can go to the gym, but if you're not sleeping, you're eating crap, right? Yeah, right. Are you going to get the best gains you could? Right. No. And, and so while, yes, we said that about my wife, also found out my wife was severely gluten sensitive. And then as we did her genes, she's got celiac genes. And it's like, yeah, you probably are celiac actually. Because every time you <laughs> eat it, you'll get a headache within 30 seconds now. Right. Um, you know, so it, it's taking that full approach and not just making it one thing. Cause it's kind of easy to try to find that one thing instead of being like, Hey, look for her, it was nutrition, but it's also exercise physically, but it's also cognitive exercise. It's also like, Hey, let's make sure you're getting your sleep, right? Let's control your stress. When you take that full picture, you now have the best chance of recovery and it's about really just supporting your brain and respecting your brain. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, I'm glad you mentioned stress because people don't realize how much stress is very inflammatory because it raises adrenaline and then cortisol and that can affect your brain. Absolutely. Yeah. So Dr. Z, I know you do functional neurology as well. And I would love for you to just talk about what that is and how you weave that into your practice with your patients. So as we talked about with like your bicep is different than your quad, we can really map the parts of the brain with eye movements to say like, okay, do we want something that's more brainstem based, more cerebellum, frontal lobe, parietal? So we use functional neurology as a way to evaluate how your brain's functioning because MRIs and CTs, they're fantastic for strokes, bleeds, fractures, tumors, and stuff like that. But they leave a lot to be desired in the brain injury world and in those who just their brain's not as good as it should be 
And so in the same way, you can make your bicep stronger by doing specific movements for your bicep. We can also make parts of your brain stronger by doing different things with your eyes, balance, hand-eye coordination, right? Like if you do stuff with your left hand, that's going to stimulate a different part of the brain than if you do with your right hand. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, it's very profound when you do it and you are very specific in what you're going after. But a lot of people kind of downplay it because it's like, oh, well, that doesn't seem glamorous. It's like, well, neither are bicep curls. But <laughs> what happens when you're consistent with that, right? You develop those muscles work really, really well. And you can do the same thing for your brain. And as a result, people are like, oh, wow, my fatigue's better. My fog's better. My right. memory's better. And right. so many other symptoms like that. Yeah. The, and the results can be a, a, absolutely dramatic. I had my son see a functional neurologist. I think it'd be important to explain uh, the difference between a functional neurologist in what you just described and a neurologist that does functional medicine, because then they're called functional neurologists as well. Just like I call myself a functional psychiatrist. So I, I but they're different. A functional neurologist, like what you just described, is really different from some, a neurologist that does functional medicine versus a traditional neurologist, right? Correct. So a neurologist that does functional medicine is they're typically looking at like the environment that can influence the brain. So they're like, hey, how's your gut? How are your hormones, right? Maybe there's mold. Maybe there's other things like that. They're trying to make sure there's nothing that's going to impact the brain from that perspective. Whereas functional neurology at its core, it's like, well, let's go directly to the brain. And so it's very much a rehabilitative model, kind of like physical therapy for the brain. So it's much more interactive from that versus just sitting across a desk and then be like, okay, here are the labs we've got. Now here are the factors you need to do to just facilitate a better environment for that. Mm -hmm. So, and because of that, like you said, with your son, you know, functional neurology, I love it. And the reason why it's kind of my big passion is the results you see can be really, really fast. The brain can change so much faster with targeted therapies than even your muscles. Like you can't make the type of gains with your muscles that you can make with targeted functional neurology in the same time frame. It's not possible. Mm, right. And is, is there a place where um, people can find a functional neurologist? Is there a website where, you know, to find a neuro functional neurologist close to them? Some of the best place would be is do the diplomate of the American Board of Chiropractic Neurology mm -hmm. or the Carrick Institute. So the Carrick Institute really trains most of those that end up doing functional neurology. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Well, you know, I, I feel like we've covered the gambit of, of everything about brain injury and concussion, but I, and I'm sure we could talk about this forever, but because we have this short amount of time, is there anything else that you would like to add that maybe it's important for people to know that they probably wouldn't hear anywhere else? You know, something that like some tidbits that, you know, that a person who is seeing uh, you know, not, you know, who's seeing a regular chiropractor, traditional chiropractor, I should say, you know, as opposed to a functional uh, neurologist, you know, that, that uh, might be helpful. Yeah. So I'm going to give a couple of tidbits. One, when we look at post-concussion syndrome, it was always thought like, oh, it's only just a small percentage of the population. JAMA did a study in 2023 and they found in those diagnosed in the emergency room, over 50% were still struggling a year later, mm -hmm. you know, six months, a year later. So it, it can definitely impact you. Next, a lot of people that, who have concussion issues and whiplash, one, if you have a whiplash from a car accident and you're doing chiropractic, physical therapy, acupuncture, massage, and it feels good when they do it, or if it makes you worse, either one, okay? But then like the next day, you're like, honestly, I went in, it felt good. And then the next day it was as if they never did anything for me. Mm -hmm. You have to think, why is that, right? They're doing this here to say, hey, you've got pain here. Let's try to help with that. But if your brain keeps saying, well, we're going to tighten up those muscles again, lock in those joints. Why is your brain doing that? It's trying to keep you safe from something. Mm -hmm. And that's where normally I'll find a lot of those patients, their brain's not as healthy as it should be. Go back through their history. They have whiplash that should have also been diagnosed as a concussion. And then when that gets treated, they're like, 
wow. Now, it not only felt amazing when I did it, but I'm keeping my results for the first time. Mm. Wow, that's awesome. That's a, a great tidbit. Now, you mentioned uh, brain mapping. Tell me more about that. Yeah, so, you know, you've got your eyes and balance we've talked about, but you can also do, you know, neurofeedback is getting really, really popular. Mm -hmm. And what you can do is use QEEGs to really see what's happening within the brain. You view it as kind of like a symphony, mm -hmm. right? Like, okay, certain parts higher or quieter than they should be. And one of the interesting things they found with depression in the brain injury population is it looks different in the brain compared to depression without. So mm -hmm. you can actually look at the flow between different parts of the brain. And that was some research Stanford did with functional MRIs. And so you've kind of got distinctive sides of that. Um, you know, and that's just, that's just another part of the puzzle. It's not always needed, mm -hmm. but it can be really beneficial. Well, it sounds like it really helps to parse what's what's going on and what symptoms are coming from where. I mean, you know, as you mentioned, insomnia and fatigue and cognitive, these are all symptoms of depression that are equally can happen without depression. So, you know, what, where, you know, how do you map that, you know? So it sounds like that, that you use that to help you even just to parse what's going on in that particular individual. Uh, and everybody shows up differently. Yeah. Right. Everyone shows up differently and their history and their symptoms. And yeah, it's, it's definitely yeah. a, putting a puzzle together. Correct. It is. And, you know, like you said, you know, it's about attributing stuff to the right thing because depression symptoms overlap so much with concussion. And that's where the evaluations and that at home evaluation I talked about is really key because your balance isn't going to be off because you're depressed. Right. 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 No, that's really, really gold there. And, uh, and it might also explain why people aren't getting better from depression uh, because these aspects are not being addressed effectively in the way that you mentioned. Correct. I see a ton of that, especially, you know, like you're in the psychiatry world, right? TMS, ketamine, all of that stuff's become more and more popular, but those patients with depression, their results just are with brain injuries are just not as good as those without brain injuries. Right. Right. When they go through it. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So why don't you tell everyone where you're from and how to find you? Uh, I know you are offering an ebook for people um, to read and it'll be in the show notes. Uh, and I always have something <laughs> to, to give people um, for free. Uh, so tell us uh, where, where people can find you. Yeah, so there you can find me on pretty much any social media at Dr. Spencer Zimmerman and you know all sorts of information there that I post with educational information. There's the ebook, Seven Symptoms of an Unhealthy Brain, you know, and it kind of helps you understand that. And if you want more detail, I even have a full book on Amazon. You can get a Kindle version. It's like a buck or two. What's the right? name of the yeah, what's the name of the book? It's called Brain Reset. Seven mm -hmm. Steps to a Healthier Brain. And we really dive in through inflammation, brain connectivity, mitochondria, and then all of the foundational aspects mm -hmm. of getting your health back on track because the foundation's not sexy, mm -hmm. but it's the foundation, right? Like you shouldn't skip steps in getting your house built with a foundation or frames. So right. same thing with our health. Absolutely. And your website is www.idahobrainandbody.com. Well, this was a great discussion. I, I can already think of five people in my practice that I think would be uh, get a great deal of benefit from this uh, interview. Um, and I really appreciate your time. This is huge. Uh, and, you know, especially connecting the dots between depression and brain injury. I think it's really important for people to hear that. And it's not just depression, anxiety and in and, and PTSD as well that you mentioned. So awesome. Thank you so much. Yep. Thanks for having me.